Hello and welcome to Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. I'm John Molesky. My guest today is Bradley Jarden. Bradley is a global fellow with the Wilson Center's Kissinger Institute on China and the United States. He joins us to talk about China's program of mass internments in Xinjiang. Bradley, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. So I want to start with a little geography lesson for people who may not be familiar with the region. Tell us about the Xinjiang so-called autonomous region. Mm -hmm. So the Xinjiang Autonomous Region is a western province of China. It's located in Central Asia, borders with uh, the Stans predominantly, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan. Yeah. So it's right in the heart of Asia. Um, it's autonomous in the sense that when the communists were building uh, their policies for ethnic minority governance, the idea was having ethnic minorities ruling their own autonomous region. But ironically, in the Chinese context, autonomy means less autonomy. Yes. And, and tell us about those, the minority, the, the Uyghur Muslims we hear a lot about. There are other minority groups within there. G give us the demographic of the population. Mm -hmm, of course. Um, so the Uyghurs are uh, Turkic uh, people, uh, Turkic speaking. So they have a lot of cultural connectivity with Central Asia more broadly. Um, they're predominantly Muslim and they account for now um, just over about around 50 percent of the population or more. And we, we, we've known about, I'm sorry, were you going to say more? Did I interrupt you? No. no okay. We, we, we know about or have known for some time about uh, the possibility, if not the reality, of human rights violations. But then recently, through leaks, we've learned a lot more. What do we know with certainty about what's happening? So what we know with certainty, so over the last couple of weeks, we've learned a lot about the inner workings of the internment system and some of the specific policies that have been implemented across the region. So the most widely cited is, of course, the internment camps that the Chinese government has been portraying as re-education centers. So this has been a program of mass internment whereby people are brought into these camps and they're taught Mandarin. They're forced to kind of abandon their culture and particularly uh, their faith and their religion. So there's been harsh crackdowns on any contact with the outside world and um, especially with relatives they have in Kazakhstan, Central Asia and other countries. Um, and also um, limitations on their faith. So even having something like a Quran can be punished. And what does China say about this and, and how do they justify this agenda? So the interesting thing is that China since 2001 has largely been um, attempting to, let's say, place separatist movements within Xinjiang or any calls for even autonomy, not even separatism, mm -hmm. um, as part of its uh, role in the war on terror. So this has been taking uh, nationalist sentiments or any influence from the outside world and position it within the context of Islamic terror. Um, so what China justifies it by is saying that China is facing a terror problem and that the camps are a rational response to create security and stability in the region. Um, but of course claims of terror are um, far more complex than they appear um, and it's connections to um, radical groups such as Al-Qaeda are very limited if existing at all. So, so since we, we have reason to doubt those claims, mm -hmm. what, what do we know about real motivations? So real motivations are, so going back to the founding of the People's Republic, we've had a long struggle for autonomy in Xinjiang. Um, so one thing people want is of course integration, a sense of their own culture and the ability to participate in the economy. Uh, the Chinese policy has been using state-owned enterprises, which predominantly hire Han population, inflow of migration. This has been seen as a long-term strategy to integrate the region by changing its demographic balance, essentially. Um, so this has created a lot of unrest, tensions. Um, some of the mechanisms that China uses, such as the Xinjiang Production and Construction Corps, which is this uh, farming conglomerate that has paramilitary uh, regiments connected to it, um, this uses a lot of coerced labor, essentially, in cotton fields, um, which is a major problem. So a lot of the Uyghurs are not only excluded from the economy, but a lot of them are even forced now into um, a labor system that, frankly, doesn't um, pay them. So ulti should. ultimately, you're describing this is about control. It's about control. Um, it's a form of inner colonialism. Or perhaps a fear of losing control might be the other side of that coin. That's another side of it as well. Yeah. Yeah. The, you, you, and, and this, Bradley, you wrote in a piece, I think, for foreign policy that the U.S. has a role in this uh, indirectly. The uncomfortable truth, here's what you wrote, the uncomfortable truth is that in the year after, years after 9-11, the United States was often willing to accept China's 
depiction of Xinjiang as uh, a strategic outpost in its global war on terrorism. In 2001, the U.S. government held 22 Uyghurs in Guantanamo Bay, a decision now widely seen as a mistake then as now. China has worked to tie the Uyghur separatist movement to international terrorism. So we are now critics. We now have action in Congress to try to stop these offenses. Mm -hmm. But your analysis is that we played a role in enabling China. Um, yeah. So as I, as I was saying, China has been really making use of the war on terror to reframe its crackdown on any autonomous uh, movements. Um, so this has involved uh, certain groups being detained in Guantanamo um, initially in the opening stages of the war on terror. Um, we've also named um, certain Uyghur groups as international terror groups. Um, so this is how it got started in terms of legitima legitimating um, China's um, framework and how it conceptualizes the problem. But there are other problems as well, even indirectly. Um, so even today, a lot of US companies are complicit in supplying a lot of the surveillance technology, um, which China is now currently using. Um, some of the most sophisticated elements of this, including um, using DNA as a form of surveillance, a lot of this is built with US, the cooperation of US companies. So that, that would seem that the US then has some leverage to, since businesses are involved in the region as well. And, and the House did just pass legislation. We still have mm -hmm. to see what the Senate and the White House does. What, is that enough? Is that the just the beginnings of reaching out on behalf of these, these people? Mm -hmm. um, so I've tried to address this in a couple of columns. So what I've argued is that although this um, Uyghur bill would be the right step forward, especially in applying elements of global Mag Magnitsky, which would allow the US to sanction Chinese officials connected mm. with the camps, but also companies that are cooperating um, with China's surveillance state. We've also seen uh, past legislation um, banning um, chi exports from Chinese security firms such as Hikvision um, and SenseTime. Um, but it's not enough. So what I argue is that to be really effective in Xinjiang, um, there needs to be a global uh, sanctions coalition. So there's limitations in the sense that a lot of European actors are also engaged in Xinjiang. Germany is a major supplier as well of both technology and industry in the region. Um, in terms of uh, exports, Xinjiang is a major producer of cotton. Um, so it supplies something like 84% of all of China's cotton, and this is using coerced labor. So any exports of cotton products are very likely to contain coerced labor uh, mm -hmm. from Xinjiang. It's a major problem. So although the US has put legislation in place to combat cooperation with Xinjiang, there are loopholes and workarounds that can be reached with Europe. So the U.S. really needs to work with its is, allies. Is anyone taking the lead in, in coordinating what could become this global sh sanctions regime? So there's more talk in Europe. Um, there have been um, open calls criticizing China signed uh, by a coalition of countries, 23 of them um, signed this uh, critique. Um, but so far, the U.S. seems to be the only actor taking real concrete steps in implementing legislation which directly sanctions uh, companies that are active in the region. Do we know why that is? Is it it's just uh, management of too many different things and this hasn't made its way up to the priorities list for the EU? Or, or are there more perhaps uh, insidious reasons that, that they're not acting? I think it's a combination of both. Uh, there are structural limitations in Europe, um, which in particular China's been playing up this. It has its format called 17 plus 1, where it reaches out with partners in Poland, Hungary, and Greece, um, and other um, less developed um, European countries in the East. Um, so China's been working up its influence within these um, systems, because Euro the European Union relies structurally on a lot of unanimity to pass its legislation. Mm -hmm. So countries that receive um, large investments, particularly through Belt and Road initiatives, um, and other um, types of investments made by China. Um, this ultimately creates division within Europe. Europe. Some countries don't want to um, restrict their Cut the trade with China, essentially. essentially yeah. the, the, the Belt and Road Initiative, and, and I, I think you've written that some of this surveillance equipment, uh, this mm -hmm. facial recognition, uh, is, is part of what China is offering in some of these partnerships. Uh, yeah, that's right. So what we're seeing increasingly is China being more bold and ex um, exporting its surveillance equipment. So it uses this in the framework of what it calls smart cities. A lot of this is aimed at things like avoiding traffic violations by identifying um, 
you know, using facial recognition yes. software to identify culprits. Um, so a lot of it is based on simple governance and promoting standards, but of course the lines between this good governance and promoting issues of potential human rights abuse is a further problem, especially we're seeing in China's willingness to cooperate with um, authoritarian systems around the world. So especially in the littoral states um, with Xinjiang and Central Asia, um, China has been a major um, exporter of surveillance equipment there. Is there a, a possibility that uh, Ch China is uh, will go too far and will uh, this backlash that is starting to percolate up will become something more significant? We're kind of seeing some trends towards that. Um, so there has been a large media campaign this past two years criticizing what's going on in China. Um, and this has promoted some some shifts. So since late 2018, we've seen the number of detainees in the camps kind of dwindling in recent years as China's kind of seeking to counteract uh, narratives on its camps. This doesn't mean the crisis is over though, however. Mm -hmm. um, what we're seeing is more the camps are being wound down themselves, but a lot of the detainees have now been transferred either to prison system, forced labor camps. There's still um, many people missing. The relatives have no information on whether they're still alive or what conditions they're in. And some have even been reported dead, but there's no details on the circumstances around it. It's a close, you can't get information easily. No, exactly, no, yeah. no rights groups on the ground or others reporting. Right, so China offers no access to outside groups um, at the moment. And now the UN is pushing to have um, a fact-finding mission in the region. What is your assessment, Bradley, of the risks of, of doing nothing versus doing too much? How do, how do you calculate what would be a measured and appropriate response? Yeah, so this is always a huge struggle. China basically, you know, Deng Xiaoping famously um, grumbled at the West manipulates human rights in order to um, intervene in China and restrict its autonomy. Um, so the government is very paranoid about any interference within its, what it sees as its internal issues. Um, so there's a problem of pushing too far too fast in the sense that it could just further isolate China and lead to the government being even more aggressive in the region. Mm -hmm. um, so this is we're seeing this now with a debate over whether China should still continue to host the 2022 Winter Olympics and whether this boycott against the sports could help you know promote Xinjiang and an unwinding of the camps. I think the best situation would be for China to basically implement a quiet stand down in the region without losing face internationally, but winding back its policies. And there needs to be further campaign of um, calling out China for its human rights abuses, especially speaking with victims, promoting um, good causes, especially getting people's passports back so they can get back in touch with their relatives, uh, finding out information about disappearances and getting people out of the prison system and also um, decoupling Western supply chains from you know, the use of coerced labor. I think these are, within reason, uh, good policies that could help unwind the situation in Xinjiang. But it's important to keep the issue of Xinjiang separate from wider U.S. interests, such as the trade war. Trade war, yeah. G given the lack of transparency and the uh, the, the difficulty in, in assessing the situation, well, what will you be looking at in the coming months to, to kind of get a, a bead on how things are trending? And do you have any expectation that this uh, legislation that's moving through the U.S. Congress can can really be significant in altering the equation? Mm -hmm. um, so, like I said, I think the, the legislation is very important. It sets an international precedent, and the hope would be that other actors uh, in the West, especially, um, will follow suit with similar policies. But this ties into wider foreign policy issues with the U.S. There's been a lot of tensions with the U.S. and with its allies, calling Europeans systemic rivals and such things, um, calling calling out the Canadians on trade and you know, issues with Australia, with South Korea now, and with Japan as well. Uh, the US instead needs to act as a bridge. Um, it needs to build these alliances and needs to encourage um, these countries to implement similar legislation to Global Bagnitsky that can really make an impact and avoid any loopholes um, for its sanctions regime.
The, the, and when you were just describing this sort of U.S. isolation of the moment, mm -hmm. you didn't even mention Mexico, and they, we could cover the entire right. globe, unfortunately, right now. It's strange times. Yeah. You know, if you're looking for U.S. <laughs> leadership, it's, it's a, a, a moment where the pause button has been hit. Thank you, Bradley, for joining us. Mm -hmm. Fascinating research. Uh, how long are you going to be with the Wilson Center? I'll be here for one year. So Excellent. Until September. Excellent. Yeah. Well, great to have you aboard, and hope to have you back on Wilson Center now in the future as well. Thanks so much, John. Thank you as well. Hope you enjoyed this edition of Wilson Center Now and that you'll join us again in the near future. Until then, for all of us at the Wilson Center, we wish you a happy and healthy holiday season and thank you for joining us.